Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I think uh, the queue is finally over. Thanks a lot for your patience. Uh, I am Alain Leroy, Deputy uh, Certification Director here, and uh, on behalf of the team here, I really want to apologize for this uh, unfortunate delay. And I have to say, we already got the first slide question, and uh, we will take it very seriously, how to improve the check-in. I think uh, that's a very good slide question. So very sorry for this. Uh, it is really unfortunate. Uh, Next year, for sure, we can promise we will do much better. And our suppliers, we will have to have a word with them after this workshop, for sure. So having said so, welcome here in Kern, a very impressive audience today, more than 500 people. First time we go over those 500 uh, participants, so thanks to you all. We will try to regain the delay, and I think we will, because the speakers are quite good at uh, managing their time, and we rely on you also to ensure that through Slido, we get the right question at the right time. Uh, just, just one uh, point to mention here on the uh, organization of that workshop. Last year, we have spent quite some time after the workshop on uh, answering uh, the questions which we were not able to answer during the workshop. It took a lot of effort from you and from us, and to be honest, we are not convinced of the real added value of this common effort. So what we have done this year, and we really appreciate your support ahead of the workshop, we had this survey. We have been very grateful for you to fill in this survey, which has really helped us to to, to build up the agenda for this, uh, for this workshop. So we already have a good uh, visibility on what your main topics of interest are. We have tried to reshuffle a bit the agenda along those lines. We have taken already some themes on questions to be answered all over the next two days. And of course, anything which is related to what we discuss we will welcome your comments and suggestions. So just one word on how we want to work during those two days. Last year, we had the side meetings, and uh, we had one presentation per side meetings, and it was a bit time-consuming. It was very interesting for those who were not attending the side meetings, but it was a kind of, we redo the discussion sometimes, and we found this a, a, a bit, uh, uh, we could improve the overall efficiency of that process. So what we have done for this year, you see on the agenda, which is quite full, we have now one session tomorrow morning for having feedback from all side meetings. So the reporters from the meetings will have to be very precise to the point. And for all of us, we really hope that with this we can maintain really uh, the, the added value of the discussions through focusing on the key information, key actions, what could be done, what could be done better, what is okay, not okay, the typical synthesis we expect after a discussion, not to redo the discussion, but really to report back to us and all of you, most important, how the side meetings went and what were the points for, let's say, improvement or the points for further work we have to undercarry all together. So having said this, on the theme of, of the workshop, no big change compared to the previous years. Last year, we spoke a lot about LOI, about those uh, kind of things. This year, we will not spend so much time on LOI because there are a lot of novelties which we want to introduce. In particular, we had last month, we are still in October, so yes, it's still last month, the new basic regulation. And Michael Averissimo is there, will guide you through this new basic regulation. It is a significant change to all of us, not only the agency, to you as stakeholder and us as agency, how to work in our, I would say, legacy historical scope, but also in some new domains. And of course, we will come back on this. We have a lot of opportunities for working more with you. Not only as what we were used to do before, a safety regulator, it is black and white, prescriptive approach and so forth, but more as partners. You will see presentations tomorrow, for instance, on innovation on research and so forth. That's a theme very uh, close to my heart, and we want to develop a lot the partnership with authority. So we have some new approaches to the work. We have, of course, the standard core business certification, flat standard and so forth, no change. Even so, we want to move toward the performance-based environment. But also what we are looking more and more is to develop some new domains where we can work with you to better prepare the future. Uh, a common comment 
very frequent comment from industry to us, will you be able to address our future challenges? Are you prepared for the coming changes? I will not mention digital transformation, but it's part of the game, and so forth. So we take it very seriously. Under Patrick's key leadership, we have a lot of initiative in the agency. You will see a lot of changes in our system, in our organization. There will be a presentation in the afternoon on what we want to do with the certification directorate. But also you will see some new activities, partnership in research, in innovative partnership, in even military programs. We are not doing military activities, but we, we really want to help industry to, for what we call civil derivatives. So this is in a nutshell what we have in mind. And having said so, since we are quite uh, late, I don't want to spend longer on this introduction. Again, welcome. I wish you all a very fruitful discussion, and we are always pleased to receive your question. Thank you very much, and now I give the floor to Marcus. Thanks, Alain, and welcome also from my side. My name is Marcus Garneman. I'm the manager for the DOA department. Also from my side, sorry for the delay with the registration. We try to recover a bit of the time, but I want to give you, uh, you all know the agenda, so I will skip this. We have plenty of time for discussions in between, because that was one of the requests from last year also, that you would like to have more possib possibilities to network, etc. cetera. Uh, but what is quite important, that you all have a page in front of you. Again, like last year, we will use uh, Slido to gather your questions. Uh, you can vote on questions that are already there, and the code, it's fairly simple, it's DOA. So it should be straightforward. You can register there and then ask your questions. Other can see their questions and either support them. So and based on that, we will filter which questions we will address. What we changed also this year, because we received due to the survey we did before, quite a number of topics, some were very specific, but some were also of generic nature, and we uh, added a survey or a, a voting possibility this year, because tomorrow we have a session to address some of these topics. So when you go to vote in Slido, you will see several topics, and you can vote for two things, two, two options. And based on that, we will focus the uh, discussion tomorrow afternoon on those topics that were voted most. And we will present this evening, and the vote is only possible today, uh, this evening you will see which topics are the most interested one that you would like to discuss with us. Like last year, we will not provide handouts in written form. You will receive everything via a link afterwards on our website. And uh, you will also receive afterwards a link to a feedback questionnaire because we would like to get uh, your feedback on how this workshop worked. I know already the answer to the first one uh, when it comes to registration. That will be for sure poor and we will try to better. But um, again, sorry for this mishap this morning. And with that, I would like to hand over to Michele Verissimo to start with the first presentation on new basic regulation. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michele Vrissimo. I was the focal point on the agency side during the legislative process for the adoption of the new basic regulation. And today I'm here to present to you a couple of elements, a very general overview of what changed with our new uh, regulation. I will uh, start uh, with a general introduction, and then I will, uh, I will go on to more detail about uh, some elements related to the scope of the regulation, more detailed um, information on what changed in relation to Part 21 will be presented afterwards by my colleague Michael Gerhardt. So to start, in fact, why are we amending the basic regulation this time? Since 2008, which was the last time that we had a big overhaul in the basic regulation, um, the situation in Europe has changed dramatically. We've seen uh, a big increase in traffic, 
uh, with the corresponding congestion of airspace and impact on the environment. Uh, we've also, we also have new market entrants, uh, such as unmanned aircraft and autonomous transport, which are changing the way that aviation uh, works. We also have a lot, an increased interorganization connectivity, which has made us increasingly vulnerable to new threats, such as cybersecurity, which we weren't really handling that much in the past. So we needed to make changes to the regulation to make sure that we were ready to face the challenges that we have currently already and that we expect to have in the next 10 years. The new basic regulation is actually part of a much broader initiative related to aviation, which is the Commission's 2015 uh, aviation strategy um, for Europe. And the basic regulation is a part of that. And at the same time, it's also based on the results of the Article 62 evaluation, which was commissioned by the management board of the agency uh, back in 2013 to assess how the European system uh, was doing. So when you look at, uh, at the regulation and at the beginning of the process, uh, the problems that, were, that we were trying to address were mainly four. The first problem was, of course, safety. And the question was, how do we keep the current level of safety in, this, in a scenario of constant growth of the aviation sector? We need to improve the way we are doing things. We need to change the way we are doing things in order to be able to keep our good uh, safety records. The second issue that we were trying to address was overregulation, because the regulatory system for aviation safety is very complex, and in certain cases it creates costs that are not uh, that may be excessive. Another issue that we were trying to address was what I already mentioned, the new market developments, and all these new technologies that we see entering into the market and which require a system that is a bit more flexible. And finally, we were trying to address also issues related to oversight, mainly the fact that we have found that there are many differences in the way that the different member states do oversight. So the basic regulation tried to address this by a set of measures that are linked around those four main items that you see on the right-hand side. So you will see a set of measures, and I will go into more detail on these uh, in a bit, that are trying to address how we use our resources, to, that are try to create a more flexible system, that try to close some gaps and inconsistencies in the IASA system, and that bring some better governance to the agency. When it comes to the timeline, um, the, the official process, let's say, to amend the basic regulation started back in December 2015 with the Commission's proposal. It had indeed started earlier because we had started uh, uh, thinking about this uh, even in, as soon as early as 2013, and there was even an EASA opinion on this. But in 2015, that was the start of the official legislative process with the Commission's proposal. Then. It took about two years, actually two years and a half, let's say, uh, for the, the proposal to go through the legislative process with all the steps uh, that were necessary, the agreements between the Parliament and the Council. And finally, the regulation was adopted in June of this year, and it entered into force in, on the 11th of September uh, last, this year. So when we look at the new basic regulation, what are the main changes? What are the main elements that we see? So the first set of changes are related to the way we use resources. And there are, uh, there are lots of things that are proposed in order to improve that. The first thing I would like to mention is this po a possibility that the new basic regulation creates for the agency to create, together with the member states, a pool um, of uh, European aviation inspectors and experts. And this is a way to allow member states and the agency to make use of each other's expertise yeah, in a way to, uh, if, have the, to may allow us to use resources more effectively. Another very important change is that the new basic regulation creates a framework for transferring responsibilities between competent authorities. 
in the current, in the old regulation, let's say, and in the, in the current implementing rules that we have, there is already the possibility for authorities to share certification tasks among each other and to ask each other to do tasks on, on their behalf. But what is transferred is only the actual doing of the tasks, but not the responsibility for them. Once you are the competent authority, for a certain organization, you will always be the competent authority for this organization, even if another authority from another member state is helping you with the oversight. What the new basic regulation foresees is the possibility for states to actually do a total transfer of responsibility to another member state or to the agency. This is in fact something that is not completely new because in the old basic regulation we already had this possibility for production organizations, for example. And that is the reason why the agency today is the competent authority for the production part of, the, of Airbus. Yeah? But in the old basic regulation, this was only restricted to a certain limit of areas. In the new basic regulation, this can be extended to every area under the new basic regulation. So member states can transfer responsibilities between each other or between them themselves and the agency. Another important change that I would like to highlight is this new figure of the oversight support mechanism. And what this is, is basically an extra additional way to allow the system to deal with a member state that is underperforming when it comes to oversight of its, um, of its organizations. In the past, whenever we had a case where through standardization we had found that there was a member state that had um, a lack of, um, of oversight capability. The only way that we had to address this, we only had two ways. One was to, uh, through an infringement process, which is a very, um, a very difficult process that takes a long time. And the other one was by redrawing mutual recognition from the certificates issued by that member state, which is a very radical uh, measure that actually affects the ability of industry to, to perform its, its activities. So now we have this third way, and what it actually means is that if there is a member state that has this chronic, let's say, systemic issue with, um, with, of, with its oversight capability, the Commission can ask the member state and EASA to jointly develop a support program for the member state where the agency will help the member state to get back in shape, let's say, and to address its, its difficulties and its deficiencies in its oversight system. Another thing I would like to mention is the, the, the creation of this of a repository of information. Yeah? And this is basically a giant database that the agency and the member states need to set up together that will include lots of information regarding the implementation of the basic regulation and, um, and the implementing rules, including information on certificates and declarations uh, issued. We also have now with the new basic regulation a real legal basis for our big data project, which we have been working on for some time already. And finally, the basic regulation also provides a better framework for the agency to work at an international level, namely by reinforcing and formalizing the coordination role that the agency has on the technical level when it comes to coordinating member states' approaches and European positions at ICAO. Another set of changes to the new basic regulation is about bringing more flexibility to the system and, uh, and promoting proportionate and performance-based rules. This is something that we as the agency have already been promoting for quite some time, but what is new now in the new basic regulation is that we have a clear mandate from the legislator to go in this, uh, in this direction. There is also a set of um, of changes that are trying to address gen specifically general aviation and that are trying to give more flexibility to the sector of aviation, namely by allowing that in certain conditions for certain activities, certificates could be eventually replaced by declarations. But this is something that we will go into more detail later on. 
Finally, the new basic regulation has a clear legal basis for the European uh, states, uh, European safety program and plan, and for the national safety programs and plans. And this is actually the way that in Europe we are implementing ICAO Annex 19. And finally, there is something else that I will mention in more detail later on, which is how the new basic regulation actually brings flexibility to the scope of the regulation by a series of opt-ins and opt-outs that I will explain in more detail later on. When it comes to closing gaps and inconsistencies, it's also important to understand that this is actually the first time that we are amending the basic regulation, the ASA basic regulation, with the intention not to really add a new uh, technical area, because even the, the main new item from a technical side in the new basic regulation, which is, uh, which is drones and also to a certain extent ground handling, they are not completely new areas because drones and ground handling were already inside the scope of the, other, of the previous basic regulation. It's just that there were no specific essential requirements on these issues. There were no specific articles on this issue. Now, the basic regulation has these articles, has this, let's say, this technical substance that was missing uh, from, uh, from, ground, from drones and, and for, for ground handling. It also contains some new uh, essential requirements on, um, on environmental protection, which we will also explain in more detail later. But basically what the new basic regulation does is, is go a little bit into areas that are adjacent to aviation safety, like aviation security, like environmental protection, which before, in the old basic regulation, it was really not so clear how much the agency could address. Since these areas are not aviation safety per se, but have a big impact on aviation safety, it was very difficult for us to completely address safety, aviation, aviation safety without looking into these areas. And so you will see that the new basic regulation extends the competency of the agency to certain elements of aviation security and additional elements when it comes to environmental protection. Finally, the last big group of amendments and changes to the new basic regulation have to do with the governance of the agency. And these have these are related mainly to the introduction of some general elements that are coming from uh, the European approach to decentralized agencies, which was agreed by the institution some years ago. But it also tries to bring some more flexibility and to improve the way that the agency uh, can manage its, resor its resources, specifically by bringing some additional flexibility for us to adjust our level of staffing uh, when it comes to staff that is financed from fees, yeah? so that we can better address the needs of industry um, and reflect that in our, in our staff plan. Finally, Another thing that I would like to mention is that the new basic regulation formalizes in many areas where the, where the Commission is already today, to a large extent, making use of our expertise uh, in order to, uh, to, to develop the, their own tasks or tasks that are um, the responsibility of the Commission. And this was something that was already going on for many years, but it was never formalized. The new basic regulation formalizes this in many areas, like security, environment, research, training, and also the implementation of the single European sky. So, when you look at the, at the system in the, that is created by the new basic regulation, what you see is that before, so under the old basic regulation, we already had a total uh, system approach to aviation safety. We were already covering all elements inside aviation safety from airworthiness to ATM ANS. 
what we will have with the new basic regulation, what we have with the new basic regulation is a total system approach to aviation. Because in addition to adding some new technical areas, like I mentioned already drones, like, like I mentioned ground handling, we are also extending the scope of the regulation to touch on aviation security, to touch on interoperability, and also to prepare us for digital transformation. So, in the end, what we have today with the new basic regulation is a stronger system that is better able to address the challenges that we see ahead of us. Now to go into a little more detail about the scope and what changes in relation to the, to the scope of the, of the regulation. Starting to talk about aircraft that are excluded from the scope. Similarly to the previous basic regulation, there is a list of aircraft that are excluded from the scope. That used to be included in what was Annex 2 to the regulation. It has now become Annex 1 to the regulation. That's the annex where you will find the list of aircraft excluded. All the aircraft that were excluded previously, like historical aircraft, military design aircraft, continue to be excluded. And in fact, there are only a couple of things that have changed when it comes to these aircraft. So, for example, all unmanned aircraft are now in the scope of the basic regulation. There used to be a, a limit related to the, to the weight of the drone, and that limit has now disappeared. So everything is in the scope of the regulation. The only exception is small tethered aircraft. But basically, we are just talking about model, model aircraft. It's, it's really nothing. Um, that relevant to us here today. Um, also, uh, small balloons and airships and powered sailplanes have been added to, uh, to Annex 1. And the mass uh, of gyroplanes has increased to 600 kilos. Another uh, issue that I would like to, um, to mention is that all operations with Annex 1 aircraft are now excluded from the scope of the regulation, regardless of the type of operation. In the previous basic regulation, when it came to some categories of excluded aircraft, like for example, historical aircraft, if those aircraft were being operated in commercial air transport, they would fall back, or the operation would fall back into the scope of the regulation. This has now disappeared. So if an aircraft is an NX-1 aircraft, it is always excluded from the scope. What other changes have there been to the scope? Well, I've already mentioned that ground handling services have been added to the scope. They have been added to the scope whenever they are provided in aerodromes that fall into the scope of the, of the regulation. And when it comes to the scope of aerodromes, related to aerodromes, it has also slightly changed uh, the criteria uh, to, to decide whether an, air, uh, an aerodrome is in the scope or not have been slightly amended. Another thing that has been changed in relation to the scope is some clarification when it comes to the design of airspace structures. But again, nothing really relevant for, for us here today. So then we can actually start talking about something else that might interest you more, which is this, uh, with the, the things that I already mentioned, the opt-ins and the opt-outs. So basically, what is an opt-in, what is an opt-out? An opt-in is when something that would normally be excluded from the scope of the regulation can actually come into the scope of the regulation. So you would have an aircraft, for example, that would be outside of the scope, that would be subject to national rules, but by an act, an opt-in, let's say, this aircraft becomes part of the system and falls under the scope. An opt-out is exactly the opposite. It's when you have an aircraft that should be included in the scope but is excluded from it. So what type of opt-ins do we have? We have basically two types of opt-in. One opt-in for what we call state aircraft or state operations. And what do I mean by this? In the new basic regulation, as in the previous regulation, there is a series of operations which the basic regulation says are excluded from the scope. And these are operations like military, police, coast guard, firefighting, and other similar services that are performed by the member state. And when an aircraft is performing those operations, it is excluded from the scope. 
What the new basic regulation brings, the, the novelty here, is that the member state can decide that for some of those operations and for some of those aircraft, they can now or in the future be subject to the basic regulation. So the first thing that you need to understand about this opt-in is, opt is that it's completely voluntary. So it depends on an act of will from the member state. The second thing is that it is modular, meaning that, for example, a member state can decide that only its police helicopters fall into the scope, but not aeroplanes, for example, and not military, so only those doing police operations and only helicopters. And it can also decide that, okay, I only apply the scope, I only apply the European rules to the airworthiness part, but not to the operations, or vice versa. So it's a modular thing, and uh, it's up to the member state to figure out and to decide what it wants to do. But of course, it's not totally up to the will of the member state. The commission can uh, have some say in it, and it can decide that it is not appropriate to have this, uh, this opt-in. And it's also important to note that it is reversible, meaning that the member state can decide that it opts in for something, and then in a year, two years, it sees, okay, it's not working, it can change its mind, and it can put things back outside of the scope of the regulation. So this is the first opt-in, yeah? The second opt-in, it's slightly different. It's um, an opt-in that is, in fact, not operated by the member state, but by a design organization. And it's an opt-in for certain aircraft that are included in Annex uh, 1, so basically for microlights. And what it means is this, if I am an organization that is going to start designing a new type of microlight, which would normally be excluded from the scope of the regulation, but I already know that my business case means that I would want to serially produce this uh, microlight, that I would like this microlight to have access to the European market and not be limited to the, the national system, then I can decide as DOA to apply to the agency for a type certificate. So this aircraft, this type, that would normally be in, under national rules can get into the YASA system. What needs to be done is that, what needs to be uh, mentioned is that this only covers the design and uh, related aspects, only the airworthiness and the initial airworthiness and the maintenance of the aircraft. So for that aircraft will continue to be an Annex 1 aircraft when it comes to the operation and when it comes to licensing, for example. So it will still be subject to the national rules. But when it comes to how it is designed, how it is produced, and how it is maintained, then it will need to uh, comply with the uh, EASA rules. The um, only thing, the other thing that I would also like to mention is that this is only for new types. So it does not apply to types that have already been approved by the member states, that have already been approved under national rules. And then, finally, what is the, the opt-out? Um, the one that is relevant uh, for us is actually a uh, an opt-out for light aircraft. And um, this is actually uh, related um, to a certain category of aircraft that are not really Annex 1 aircraft because they are above the weight limit in, uh, in uh, Annex 1. Yeah? But once the opt-out um, opt is operated, so once the member state decides to redraw uh, this aircraft from the scope, then they don't really become Annex 1 aircraft, and this is not something that will be, uh, let's say, that will be obligatory or that will have consequences on the other member states. So basically, we are creating a new category of aircraft which normally should be in the scope of the regulation, but by an act or the will of a member state becomes subject to, um, to national rules. And what we are talking about here is basically manned airplanes, manned helicopters, and manned sailplanes, having no more than two seats and uh, no more than a maximum takeoff mass of 600 or 650 kilos. So it's a, a small, 
slice, let's say, between the 400, 450 kilo category in the Annex 1, which means that they are always outside the scope, and this, this, uh, this, this threshold. And the, when it comes to weight, in fact, this is uh, broadly corresponding to the US light aircraft category. So what happens is uh, that if the member state decides to, to, uh, to opt out, then this aircraft will be subject to national rules. But what is also important to say is that even in this case, uh, the design organization always has the choice to apply for an EASA type certificate. So in fact, in the end, what happens is that there is a creation of a possibility for a parallel certification under the national system and under the EU system. The reason why this was introduced was in fact a political compromise between the Parliament and the Council because there were basically two main factions, let's say, um, which some that wanted to keep the weight limit in Annex 1 and others that wanted to raise it uh, to 600, 650 kilos. And in order to reach a compromise, this is what this was happened. We maintained the limit of 450 kilos, but with the possibility for member states to, um, to opt out. We are still not completely sure how this is going to work. Uh, we just received uh, recently the, the first indications of some member states wanting to opt out. Uh, we are in the process of discussing with them how this is going to work. So this is the end of my presentation because of, um, of problems that we had with time. Um, all the elements that are specifically related to Part 21 will be covered by uh, Michelle Gerhardt. Uh, but I would like to uh, tell you uh, something else, that the agency is preparing an e-learning, uh, so an online training course on the new basic regulation, which should be available on our website uh, from the second half of November on. And this is going to be available to everybody. And in this online training course, you will find these slides that I presented to you today, but also many more slides with more details on the changes that happen in all technical areas, not only airworthiness, but licensing, ops, etc. So I hope you will find that useful. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michaela. We received a number of questions directly related to your presentation. Um, and I will just read a few of them. A few, yeah. Um, the first one, will the Annex 1 opt-in aircraft be validated by FAA? Does EASA have su to support this validation? Can you please repeat, Marcus? Sorry. Ah, uh, it's there. Yeah. The question is, will the Annex 1 opt-in aircraft be validated by FAA, and does EASA have to support this validation? Uh, OK, so let me see if I understood. So if you are asking that if an aircraft was Annex 1, so normally out of the scope, but then it's opted in, so it gets an EASA type certificate, then I would say that it should be validated by the FAA normally as any other aircraft that has been, uh, re that has received a type certificate uh, from EASA. Basically, when it comes to the airworthiness, the aircraft will just uh, be as any normal aircraft that is in the scope. Okay, then there was a question whether this training, this online training from EASA will be for free? Yes, it Good. will be for free. That's an easy one. Um, a more tricky one, is EASA prepared to cope with opt-ins when it comes to resources? Thanks for the question. <laughs> well, um, we are as prepared as, as we can be. Uh, it's not like we are being flooded with uh, requests for, uh, for opt-ins. We are in the process of, of course, discussing uh, the consequences of the, um, of the new basic regulation with the member states. So we are in a dialogue with them. 
and uh, what we uh, what we have agreed is that we would we will deal with these uh, opt-in cases as they appear on a pilot uh, project basis so once we have one of these requested we will deal with it and uh, and uh, together with the member state and we will try to find uh, ways to to do it better in the future the issue is that this is really new for us it's really new for the member states so at this moment it's it's really difficult for us to really have a complete idea of, of what it means in terms of resources also because like i mentioned to you most of these opt-ins are really modular so they really depend on what the member state will decide the impact on resources will be very depending on that so we are as prepared as we can be right now then you talked about the European inspectors, and the question is, are they used for production organizations, design organizations, or for inspection of in-service equipment? Well, uh, if you are referring to the inspectors in the pool of inspectors, they are all types of inspectors. So everything that could be included, uh, everything that is included in the scope of the, of the regulation. So uh, once this pool of experts will be available, um, then it will cover all areas under, under the regulation. Uh, since you are still there, uh, Michaela, we have one, of course, on uh, Brexit. <laughs> and uh, what about transfer of competent authorities? So maybe, Michaela, you could start on the transfer of competent authorities. Could this be a way to deal with Brexit? That one. Well, the transfer of responsibilities between competent authorities is about member states. So it's a transfer of responsibilities between authorities of member states. So unfortunately, <laughs> since the issue with Brexit is related to the fact that the UK will no longer be a European member state, then it will not solve the, the issue of, of Brexit. Maybe a few words on, on Brexit, because of course we all know very well it's a topic we are all working very hard on. But first, just to mention that Yaza is aware of your concerns and we share uh, your question marks, let's say, for the future. Uh, the EEC and the UK government are having, as you know, very intense negotiation. And what is very important here, uh, YASA is contributing, but is not a party per se into those negotiations. So we are following very closely what's happening. We are informed, uh, and uh, we are not driving the show here. So we, I would say, a bit sorry, we apologize in advance not to answer your questions in detail, because we are a bit like you. We are expecting a lot of things. It's coming, the deadline is coming. We provide technical inputs to the negotiators, and you know that we are one element of the big picture. So uh, we take note of, of your points here. We encourage you to consult regularly the uh, Commission websites where they publish regularly a lot of information. There were, uh, mid of April, you know only too well, the first communication on how could things develop. There was a bit uh, later on in July, 19th of July, another communication on our website, Yaza, we relay those information coming from the Commission, but please accept that we are not the, the leading party here. In the worst case scenario, what is mentioned today on the Yaza and on the Commission website is that in the worst case scenario, yes, indeed, certificates would become invalid. Now that's the worst case scenario. And we are all always prepared for the worst case scenario, but of course, we expect the best. So uh, let's continue supporting the negotiation. I'm sure that through your uh, business lobby group and so forth, you are extremely busy. We understand uh, your fears and we share some of them because we are partners. <coughs> But today, that's all what we can report to you, and 
please, yes, uh, just continue monitoring what is going on between the negotiators. We will keep on our website regularly information up to date, as far as we know. And in any case, we expect to have a bit more clarity in the next, let's say, weeks, because time is flying. And that's unfortunately all what we can say for today. Michaela, do you want to add anything in that respect? Not on Brexit, no. <laughs> I don't want to add anything on that. Um, maybe I can uh, try to answer a couple more questions. Um, so yes, um, there is uh, the, the information on the, on the opt-in, on all the opt-ins and opt-outs will be provided by YASA. Once the repository of information is online, it will be include it there until that time because it's still going to take us some time to uh, to finalize that we will provide this information on our website there was also another question since i'm talking about the repository there was a repository a question whether the repository's information would be available to industry and the answer is partially not all information is going to be publicly available um, most of it is actually only to be shared between easa and the member states Um, there is a question about whether there is any impact on EASA DOAs um, outside of you member states. Well, you will see that uh, when it comes to, to DOAs, the, the, Michelle will explain to you that there is really no immediate impact because the changes that are made will require Part 21 to be uh, amended in any case. But once they are amended, or at, at least let's say at the level of the basic regulation, there is no distinction between a DOA located inside the member state or outside the member state. So at the level of the basic regulation, there, there is no, no such uh, distinction. So it's, if a distinction would be made, it would need to be made at the level of the implementing rules, and uh, it would need to be justified, I, I guess. I don't know exactly uh, what type of uh, distinction you would have in mind. Um, Which one? Well, normally, it's, a, it's actually a good question, because the opt-in does not mean that there is also a transfer of competent authority. So, for example, we are mentioning police operations. Normally, since, as is the case with operations in general, the oversight will be done by the member state. So the opt-in means that the IASA rules for operations would apply, but it also means that it would be the member state that would be responsible for that oversight. The opt-in would not necessarily extend the competencies of the agency, except when it comes to the things that are already under our competence, like uh, design. For example. Okay, with that I think we stop it for here because some of the questions are also related to what Michael is going to present. I think we can address them a bit later. Thanks Michaela.